welcome to our worship service and I pray we'll all sense God's presence and hear him speak to us through his word as we worship him together today. And if you're visiting with us today, I give you a special welcome. There's three announcements that I want to uh, draw your attention to today. First of all, will the members of the Congregational Committee please remain in their seats at the end of the service? Uh, we need to have a short meeting, and that's probably the easiest thing if you just stay in your seats. Then uh, our midweek meeting uh, resumes on Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. We'll meet in the main hall uh, for our, our midweek meeting. Uh, we'll be looking at the Christian attitude to work. And in line with the most recent guidelines we have received from Church House, everyone attending our midweek meeting is encouraged to wear a face covering. Then, God willing, our worship services will continue in our meeting house uh, next Lord's Day at 11 a.m. Peter calls us to worship God with these words. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. God saves us by his grace, and he enables us to grow as a Christian by his grace. In fact, we can only be sure that we have a genuine saving faith if there's evidence of the fruit of the Spirit growing in our life. We're going to stand and praise God using our opening hymn at Search Me, O God. This hymn is based on part of Psalm 139. It's really a prayer asking God to show us where we're deliberately or unintentionally continuing to sin. But we're also asking God to cleanse us from our sin and to enable us to rely on his strength to live in obedience to him from now on. So let us stand to praise God with Search Me, O God.
privilege tonight now to gather in our prayer of adoration, confession, and thanksgiving. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we praise you for being omnipresent. You are not just here with us. You are everywhere. When we are your child, there is nowhere we can go where your spirit is not there. We echo the words of the psalmist David when he said, If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Not even darkness can hide us from your all-seeing gaze because the darkness is as light to you. We also recognize that you're the all-knowing God. In some ways this is comforting to us, but in other ways it's unnerving. You know everything we do. You know what we say even before a word is on our tongue. And you know our very thoughts. We may try to hide these things from other people, but we cannot hide anything from you. God of mercy, this means you know all about our sin. Forgive us for the times when we have ignored or excused the sin that is in our life. Help us to sincerely pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. When you point out our sin, enable us to be humble enough to seek your forgiveness. Today we particularly confess the times when we have overindulged in food or drink. Forgive us for allowing laziness to prevent us from working to the best of our ability around home or in school or in our workplace. We also confess the times we've allowed laziness to prevent us from worshipping you personally every day or corporately with our church family each week. Forgive us for looking lustfully at others, entertaining impure thoughts and committing immoral actions. We confess the times we have failed to guard what is entering our minds through our eyes and our ears. Forgive us for running towards temptation rather than fleeing from it. We confess the times we have failed to saturate our minds with what is good. Forgive us for listening to gossip, slander, and criticism of others, leading us to think badly of them. We confess the times we have failed to control our temper. Forgive us for the times we have indulged in resentment, self-pity, or bitterness. Thank you that Jesus himself bore all our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. We praise you that we have been healed by his wounds. Gracious God, as your children, we long to be cleansed from every sin so that we're pure within. We know that we'll not be perfect until we are with you in heaven, but we want to grow to be more like Christ every day. Our desire is to glorify your name in our life. And this can only happen as the Holy Spirit works in our heart. So fill our hearts with your great love. Take our lives and make them wholly yours. Help us to surrender our will, our emotions, and our pride to you. Sovereign Lord, we long for revival in our congregation, in our community, and in our country. But we realize that revival comes from you and that it must start with us. So we earnestly pray that you would begin that revival in us today. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading is Titus chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 5 and reading down to the end of chapter 2. In this uh, passage, um, Paul speaks to Titus about various groups and about their need for self-control, which is the fruit of the Spirit that we're thinking about today. As we read through these verses, I try and count how many times uh, that phrase self-control is used for these various groups. So Titus chapter 1, beginning to read verse 5 and reading down to the end of chapter 2. This is God's word we're reading together. 
The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good, in your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority, do not let anyone despise you. Amen. We thank God for his holy, inspired, and inerrant word, and we pray that he will write its eternal truth upon all our hearts. Our second hymn is um, known as Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, sadly, this verse has often been taken out of its context by people to teach that this means that we can do anything we want to do. But that's not what Paul meant. Paul meant that God strengthens us to live for him and to serve him. And when we look at self-control later in our service, we'll see that we need to continually rely on God's strength to live in obedience to him. And that's mentioned in this hymn. We're just going to keep our seats we're going to listen as Emily plays and look at the words as they appear on the screen.
Okay, the boys and girls can now leave for uh, Children's Church over in the main hall. Let us seek God's help as we come to his word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' gracious name we pray. Amen. Last week, we we looked at gentleness. We noted that while God is the all-powerful creator, sustainer, and sovereign ruler of the universe and everything in it, he's also gentle with his people. We saw that the gentleness which Jesus displayed as he interacted with people is to be the template for our interactions with the members of our physical family and our church family, with the people that we work amongst, and the people that we rub shoulders with as we go about our daily business, regardless of whether these people are Christians or not. In particular, we should seek to make people feel at ease in our presence. We should respect the dignity of other people. We should avoid blunt speech or an abrupt manner. We should be reasonable and considerate. Today we're looking at self-control, as I mentioned earlier, and I encourage you to have your Bibles open there at that passage we read from Titus chapters 1 and 2. In Bible times, a city without good walls was easy prey to its enemies. And this led the Holy Spirit to inspire Solomon to say, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Self-control is the believer's wall of defense against the sinful desires that wage war against our soul. Without self-control, we're easy prey to our enemy, the devil. We have a natural tendency to overindulge our various appetites, so we need to restrain them. And self-control is the healthy regulation of our desires so that we avoid excesses of anything and instead we stay within reasonable bounds for everything. Self-control requires us to keep watch over a much wider range of things than just our bodily desires and appetites. We must also exercise self-control of our thoughts, our emotions, and our speech. Self-control means saying yes to what we should do and saying no to what we shouldn't do. For example, when it comes to having our daily quiet time, Satan will ensure that lots of other things seem much more interesting or important to do. So a natural expression of self-control is to ensure that we have a time and we have a place where we settle down each day And we tell ourselves, this is something that I need to do. Self-control is necessary because we're at war with our sinful desires. James teaches us that these desires drag us away and they entice us into sin. What makes these sinful desires so dangerous is that they dwell within our heart. The external temptations we face wouldn't be anywhere near as dangerous if it weren't for the fact that they have a ready ally within us. Self-control is an essential trait of the real Christian that enables us to obey Jesus' words when he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The word self-control in our English Bible translates two different words in the original language that the Bible was written in. The first word refers to the inner strength of our character, which enables us to control our desires and appetites. The second word conveys the idea of allowing sound judgment to control our desires, appetites, thoughts, emotions, and actions. And it's easy to see how those two ideas complement one another. Sound judgment allows us to determine what we should do, and inner strength 
provides the will to do it. Sound judgment is critical to the exercise of self-control because it not only enables a genuine believer to distinguish right from wrong, it also enables us to work out what's best amongst what's right. Sound judgment helps us to determine the boundaries of moderation in our appetites and our desires. It also helps us to regulate our thoughts and keep our emotions under control. But sound judgment isn't enough to enable us to be self-controlled. Inner strength is also essential. All too often, we know very well what's the right and best thing to do. But we don't do it because we allow our feelings to overrule our judgment. Ultimately, self-control is the exercise of inner strength under the direction of sound judgment that enables us to do, think, and say those things which are pleasing to God. Since this fruit of self-control affects so many aspects of our lives, we're going to look at it in three areas. First of all, we're going to consider controlling our bodies. God created mankind to enjoy things that are pleasant to our senses and our bodily appetites. This is why we're told that the trees God created were both beautiful and nutritious. Paul declared to Timothy, God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So we can be sure that God intends us to enjoy the physical things of this life which he has so graciously provided us with. But our desires, along with every other part of our being, has been corrupted by the fall. So the things which God intends for our use and our enjoyment have a tendency to become our masters. And that's why Paul stated to the Corinthian Christians, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. The moderation that results from self-control keeps permissible things from being masters of our bodies. In Titus chapters 1 and 2, which you have open in front of you, we see Paul saying that self-control is a requirement for elders, but it's also important for young and old men and women. So it's to be a characteristic of all Christians. Self-control of the body, which we're thinking about at the moment, should be primarily aimed at overindulgence in food or drink, laziness, and sexual immorality. I don't know how big a problem drunkenness is among Christians, partly because I've never heard a Christian admitting to getting drunk. But we've all admitted to overeating. And we've all heard other Christians admitting to overeating. We overindulge in alcohol or food when we allow our appetite to range out of control and lead us into sin. So we need to remember that Paul tells us that even our eating and drinking is to be done to the glory of God. Laziness. It's bad enough to be lazy around home or at school or in the workplace, but it's even more serious to be lazy when it comes to our devotion to God. So to check if this is a problem for us, we're going to think about an incident in Jesus' life. Mark informs us that rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Jesus getting up to pray while it is still dark is a big enough challenge to us. But in the verses immediately preceding this one, Mark tells us that on the previous evening, all the people who were sick and demon-possessed had been brought to Jesus to be healed by him. In fact, the whole town gathered where Jesus was staying. So undoubtedly, when Jesus tumbled into bed at the end of that day, he would have been very tired. 
Under such circumstances, you and I would have felt that we deserved to lie in the next morning after all that good work we had done. But Jesus knew the importance of spending time with his father in fellowship. So he disciplined his body to get up while it was still dark and to go out and have that fellowship. Now we can't just dismiss this incident by saying, well, Jesus could do this because he's God. Remember, Jesus became fully human while remaining fully God. So Jesus got just as tired as we do. Also notice that Even though Jesus is God, he still prioritized spending time in prayer. Sadly, some of us don't have a productive, quiet time each day because we're lazy in body and we're undisciplined in the use of time. On the other hand, some of us are self-controlled enough to have a daily fellowship with God. But we're abusing our bodies through a continual lack of essential rest or recreation. Or we're neglecting our bodies by failing to exercise. All of us need to learn godly self-control of our bodies when it comes to this whole area of how we use them. Sexual self-control belongs to both the body and the mind. God's standard for sexual self-control always has been and always will be absolute abstinence outside of heterosexual marriage relationships. I'll say that again. God's standard for sexual self-control always has been and always will be absolute abstinence outside of heterosexual marriage relationships. The author of Hebrews states, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. God's design for sexuality has been under attack right from the very beginning of time and we're seeing all sorts of attacks being made on it in our day. But Paul's words to the Thessalonian believers emphasize that there's absolutely no room for compromise in this. It is God's will that you should be holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. Christians must exercise self-control, not only in the area of sexual activity, but also in the area of impure thoughts, lustful looks, and suggestive speech. Jesus said, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in her heart. A lustful look can all too easily become an impure thought which leads to an immoral action. And that's why godly Job made a covenant with his eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. This is something that we should rely on God's strength to do. Because we're living in an increasingly hyper-sexualized society. This naturally leads us into the next area of self-control that we want to consider. Which is controlling our thoughts. Paul told the Corinthian Christians to take every thought captive to obey Christ. Self-control of our thoughts means entertaining in our minds only those thoughts that are acceptable to God. The best guidelines we have for evaluating our thoughts is given by Paul in Philippians 4. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. Self-control of our thoughts is more than just refusing to admit sinful thoughts such as lust, greed, envy, and selfish ambition into our minds. It also includes focusing our minds on that which is good. Solomon warned, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Now, the Hebrew word that's translated as heart in that verse 
refers to our entire conscious being, including our understanding, our emotions, our conscience, and our will. However, the warning is particularly applicable to our thought life because our minds are like greenhouses where sinful thoughts are planted and then nurtured before being transplanted out into the outside world as sinful actions. You see, we seldom plunge suddenly into gluttony or sexual immorality. These thoughts are savored in our mind long before they're indulged in our body. This highlights that our thought life is our first line of defense in the battle for self-control. The gates to our mind are our eyes and our ears. What we look at and watch and read and listen to plays a big part in what we think about. So guarding our minds begins with guarding our eyes and ears. We mustn't allow what encourages lust, materialism, envy, or selfish ambition to enter our minds. This means we need to avoid TV programs, movies, internet sites, social media feeds, music, magazines, newspapers, and conversations that arouse such thoughts in our minds. Throughout the New Testament, Paul commands us to flee from temptations. And when that's taken along with Solomon's instruction to guard our heart, we see that Paul and Solomon took temptation much more seriously than many Christians do today. Instead of guarding our minds, we often open them to the flood of ungodly material that's contained in all sorts of media. Instead of fleeing from temptations, we often indulge them in our thoughts. We allow in our minds what we wouldn't allow in our actions because other people can't see our thoughts, but God sees them. David said to God, you discern my thoughts from afar. A genuine Christian seeks God's help to control their thoughts, not because of what other people think, but because of what God thinks. Paul told the Philippians to think about what is true, honorable, and just, as well as what is pure, lovely, and commendable. Some Christians aren't tempted to have impure thoughts, but they're tempted to entertain thoughts that aren't true, honorable, and just. So we need to flee from gossip, slander, and criticism of others, because it's impossible to think true, honorable, and just thoughts about someone when we have listened to gossip, slander, and criticism of them. And if we guard our thoughts, it'll be easier to guard our tongues because Jesus said that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The third area of self-control we want to consider today is our emotions. Our emotions that need to be controlled are things like anger, resentment, self-pity, and bitterness. Such emotions such as anger can be explosive. Others such as self-pity are simmering away in the background. But whether they're explosive or simmering, such emotions are displeasing to God. Having an uncontrolled temper is inconsistent with seeking to be godly. Outbursts of rage are not only harmful because they reveal our own sinful emotions, but because they hurt those on the receiving end of them. They create bitterness and they destroy relationships. Solomon said, better a patient man than a warrior, a man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. The battle to take a city usually only lasts for a relatively short time. But for some believers, the battle to control their temper is a lifelong one, which they can only make advances in by relying on God's strength. While an uncontrolled temper is primarily harmful to those around us, 
and to our relationship with them. Other uncontrolled emotions such as resentment, self-pity, and bitterness are primarily harmful to ourselves and to our relationship with God. If we don't seek the Holy Spirit's help to control resentment, self-pity, and bitterness, they build up inside us, and they eat away at our spiritual life like a slowly spreading disease. All of these sinful emotions that we have thought about have one thing in common, and that's a focus on ourselves. They put our disappointments or our wounded pride or our shattered dreams on the throne of our hearts where they become idols to us that we worship. We know in our head that God works all things for the good of his people. And we know that nothing can separate us from his love in our head. But we ignore these promises in practice. And we choose instead to dishonor God by nurturing resentment or bitterness or by wallowing in self-pity. Relying on God's power to control our emotions is just as necessary as relying on God's power to control our bodies and our thoughts. As we seek God's help to cultivate the fruit of self-control, our emphasis should be on growing because we know we'll never attain full self-control in every area in this life. We also need to realize that the battle for self-control is different for all of us. One person may have no problem controlling their bodily appetites, but they may indulge in resentment or self-pity. Another person may not have to deal with impure thoughts, but they may struggle with thoughts of pride. When we're tempted to judge others for their lack of self-control in areas that aren't a problem for us, we should remember the areas that we are struggling to control and be charitable in our opinion of others. We have seen that sound judgment is essential for us to be able to exercise self-control. So we need to have a thorough knowledge of God's standards for our bodies, our thoughts, and our emotions. And those standards are revealed in Scripture. The great evangelist D.L. Moody said, the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. Sound judgment also enables us to accurately identify the particular areas of weakness where we need God's help to cultivate self-control. After having studied both scripture and ourselves, we need to honestly answer the question, am I willing to give up the fleeting pleasures of sin in order to please God? We need to have Jesus as the Lord of our bodily appetites and desires, the Lord of our thoughts, and the Lord of our emotions. While self-control begins with sound judgment, it must be carried forward by surrender to the authority of Jesus in every area of our lives. Next, we need to realize that the struggle for self-control is fought primarily in our minds. So if we seek the Holy Spirit's help to say no to sinful desires when they first enter our mind, then they'll not lead to sinful actions or emotions. This means we need to make our particular area of weakness the subject of earnest prayer to God for his grace to be at work in our wills to conform them to his will. It's well known that our will is strengthened by obedience. So the more we say no to sinful desires, the more we'll be able to say no. And the more we say yes to godly desires, the more we'll be able to say yes. A large part of cultivating self-control is relying on God's power to break bad habits and to replace them with good habits. As we grow in self-control by God's grace and by God's guidance, 
will be freed from the shackles of self-indulgence and will be brought into the glorious freedom of true spiritual discipline. We're going to come to God now in prayer and we're going to ask him to help us to apply the lessons we have learned from his word to our life. And we're going to seek his help for other people. So let us come before God with our prayers of intercession. Most gracious heavenly Father, yet again you have used the light of your word to search us and to point out the sin that still lurks in the depths of our heart. We pray that you will help us to control our bodies so that we do not overindulge in food or drink. Also help us to control our bodies so that we're not lazy around home or in school or in our workplace. And so that we prioritize worshiping you individually each day and corporately every week. Help us to control our bodies so that we do not look lustfully at others or entertain impure thoughts or commit immoral actions. Enable us to control our thoughts by guarding what is entering our minds through our eyes and ears and by fleeing from temptations. Also help us to control our thoughts by saturating our minds with what is good and by refusing to listen to gossip, slander and criticism. Enable us to control our emotions so that we do not demonstrate unrighteous anger or indulge in resentment, self-pity, and bitterness. Lord of the church, we bless you that every genuine believer in our congregation is part of the body of Christ and is a living stone in your spiritual house. Forgive us for the times when we have not recognized each other to be these things. Also forgive us for complaining about our spiritual family, for selfishly putting our own needs before the needs of others, and for neglecting to meet with our brothers and sisters in Christ for their encouragement and for our encouragement. We praise you that the experience of lockdown has helped us to value that chat we have with one another before or after worship, which lets us see that someone else cares about us. It has also enabled us to appreciate the opportunity to join with others to praise you, and it has given us a new sense of awe at the preaching of your word as it challenges and encourages us in our daily walk with you. Thank you for enabling us to increasingly grasp the wonder of your invitation to ask, seek, and knock in prayer. As we have seen you answer many different prayers in various ways. Help us not to lose this renewed appreciation for the fellowship provided in our church family. Motivate us to pray for all those who lead and serve in our congregation and to support them in every way we can in these unchartered and uncertain days. As we begin a new church year this week in completely different circumstances than we have ever done before, we pray that it might be one in which the spiritual life of our congregation is deepened. Enable us all to be committed to seeing your kingdom grow in this place and help us to be good witnesses to Jesus as we show those we interact with on a daily basis that we belong to him and we belong to one another. We ask that you would continue to make a way through the many obstacles to normal church life that result from the ongoing coronavirus restrictions and enable ministry and mission to take place to your glory. All-knowing God, we bless you for the increased medical and scientific understanding of COVID-19. And we ask that you would grant continued progress in finding ways to combat its effects. We also pray that you would bless the global search for a vaccine for this virus. We praise you that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made by you. So you know exactly how our bodies work and what to do to heal them when they're not working properly. We ask that you would do this for those we know and love who are ill in any way at this time, if that is your will. 
In Jesus' strong name we pray all these things. Amen. Our closing hymn is Yield Not to Temptation for Yielding is Sin. We will be tempted every day. Being tempted isn't sin. It's giving in to the sin, yielding to the sin, yielding to the temptation, you should say, that is sin. And this hymn reminds us that each time we rely on God's power to resist a temptation, this strengthens us to resist future temptations. So let us stand to praise God. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Congregation committee, please keep your seats. And the rest of you, please leave and allow the meeting house to empty from the end. I'll go to the near aisle door just because of the the meeting uh, today. Mm -hmm.